That's right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and kick it off. So welcome everybody. I'm Peggy Kuiper. I'm Director of Sport and Recreation Business at UAF. And uh, we're here tonight with a really impressive panel. I think um, I would argue this is the most impressive panel that we've had. And so kudos to Michelle and Spencer and Cole for setting it up. And also thanks to AJ, Tim, uh, Carol, and Paul for joining in. So, um, and as always, a thanks to Mark, our Dean, uh, for being willing to support this uh, endeavor and I'm really excited to hear from all of you tonight. So Michelle, the floor is yours. Excellent. Well, thank you, Peggy, as always, for the incredible support to put together panels like these and Dean Herman. It's just been absolutely fantastic to be able to do this last semester and this semester. And Peggy, I would agree with you. This is absolutely one of the most impressive panels that I have had the privilege to host. And I am incredibly excited um, special shout out to Cole McKeel, who helped us put together um, these folks for the discussion tonight. So really excited. And I don't want to spend too much time talking, but just a, a few housekeeping things, quick introduction. My name is Michelle Galino. I um, am an adjunct professor at UAF in the uh, Sports Business Recreation Program, uh, but I'm also going into my fourth season with the Dallas Cowboys in corporate partnerships. Um, so essentially, I work with brands to strategically deliver on their key business objectives and use the Cowboys as a platform to do so. Um, similar to some of the folks that we've talked to thus far in the, um, the panelists. But a few housekeeping things that we go over if you've been on these panels uh, before, these will sound very familiar to you. Um, if you're comfortable turning your camera on, please do so. Um, I know. I am not comfortable speaking to a lot of black squares on the screen. I love to see people's faces. So please, if you are comfortable, we want this to be the most engaging um, panel as possible. So go ahead and turn your camera on. Um, and outside of that, just go ahead and please keep, and there's a cat here too. This is great. Look at this, <laughs> the more the merrier. <laughs> Any animals are also welcome. Um, <laughs> and uh, please just keep your microphone on mute. Um, just we don't want any feedback if, uh, during the panel discussion. Um, but if you do have questions, please do utilize the chat. Uh, if we don't get to them, we'll always try and follow up as much as we possibly can to address your questions um, and get them over to the panelists and connect you all afterwards. Um, but to get started, um, I would love to introduce our panelists. Again, this is about the Olympics, Tokyo coming up this summer, different roles and responsibilities within the Olympic movement. Um, and we have a really great representation of a couple different verticals within uh, the world of the Olympics. So I will let the panelists introduce themselves. And Tim, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle and, and Peggy and group for joining. Uh, excited to be here. So um, hopefully we can provide some good insight into uh, into the Tokyo Olympic Games. Um, I'm Tim Ambruso. Uh, I work in our events and logistics department at the U.S. Uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Um, my, my two major uh, areas that I oversee are our ground transportation and our uh, non-village accommodations. Um, so that's sort of everything from the, the start uh, our beginning surveys, um, just sort of as soon as we, we learn where the games are going to be hosted, um, going all the way through assessing needs, what resources we need, the planning, um, contracting, preparations, all that good stuff, all the way through the execution of the Olympic and Paralympic Games um, in that country. So, um, <clears throat> and then I don't, Michelle, if you want us to go through, we, I can do sort of the how I got started and do that piece or do you just want a quick intro? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. <clears throat> um, so I essentially started, um, I didn't actually start in sports, but um, how I got into sports, I ended up um, uh, in grad school um, doing a couple internships with uh, Cronky Sports. Um, so you guys will probably know them as Nuggets, Avalanche, um, Rapids, uh, Pepsi Center, lots of other things like that. So um, I did a few internships with them during grad school. Um, after graduation, uh, I actually then did an internship at the USOPC uh, at our training center here in Colorado Springs uh, in the operations department. Um, and then after that um, was a temp uh, for a little while and then got hired on full time uh, in operations at, at the training center. Um, after a couple of years doing that, I actually moved over to USA Volleyball in their high performance division. 
um, where I did mostly logistics um, and event planning from that standpoint. Um, and then from there, I got rehired a couple of years later um, at the USOPC. Um, and then through a series of changes ended up in, in our uh, division that's called events and logistics uh, at that point. So um, started there really in, in about 2014. So um, had several different roles within that, but um, I would say the internship is really what started me in um, and got me sort of the, the foot in the door um, from the sports world standpoint. So uh, I'm a Colorado native, um, grew up in Denver. Um, so I'm not too far from home, uh, which is good. Um, and, uh, I just, yeah, I enjoy the Colorado weather and being outdoors. So. Gosh, who doesn't enjoy that Colorado weather? That's, it's amazing. Well, um, I, I venture to think we're, we're going to dive into a little bit more about the importance of that internship in a little bit. So I'm excited to chat through that, Tim. Um, but just moving on for introductions, Carol, go ahead. Why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Carol Callen, the Women's National Team Director for USA Basketball. And in that role, I am responsible for coordinating the selection, the training, uh, and going to the competitions for all of our women's teams. We begin at the age of 16 and under, all the way up through the Olympic Games. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to describe those kinds of jobs. Uh, to, to say exactly what goes on. All I know is that I work a lot all day, every day. Um, so it'll come out a little bit more, I guess. Uh, through that, however, I have the opportunity to also chair two of our selection committees, our, our youngest selection committee, and also then our Olympic level selection committee. Um, we've been pretty good. We won six straight gold medals uh, in five of six World Cups. We're going for our seventh gold medal in Tokyo. Uh, I think the reason that we do well is we have the best players and coaches in the world, but we also have a healthy respect for our opponents. We know it's not easy. I think uh, really people that are really good at what they do make things look easy. And I think that's um, a false sense of security, certainly for somebody like me who stays up or wakes up in the middle of the night thinking about all those things that could go wrong, that, that someone has to do that. And that's people like me. Um, the way I started, I had a father who was a basketball coach and an older brother. So I just tagged along and fell in love with sports in general, not just basketball. I did a little bit of everything. I was that age where you could do a little bit of everything uh, and, and grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I then uh, went off to college and graduate school and ended up at the University of Colorado and became a teacher, a math teacher and a basketball coach at a local high school. Uh, and then after winning a state championship, became the athletic director at the high school. Uh, went to a national high school athletic directors conference and ran into a guy that was working for the National Federation of High Schools, who was the athletic director at my dad's high school. So I hadn't seen him for years. I was a little kid I went up to him, introduced myself, he was like, oh my gosh. And so I ended up, they, he eventually at the end of that week of that, that clinic, he uh, asked me if I wanted to be on a basketball committee. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. I, you know, I had no idea what it was. Well, it turns out I became the high school representative to what's called the games committee at USA Basketball, which picks all of the players and coaches. So for four years, I was on that com committee with 22 others, the best coaches in the land. So I got to know them. Uh, and then after that, that was the 92 Olympics. After the 92 Olympics, they asked me to chair the selection committee. So I'm still a volunteer, still at my job at the high school. Um, and in 94, the decision was to put a national team program together for a full year. And it began, I began then in, as an employee and the director of that national team in February of 95, which led into the Olympics in 96. And that was then the first gold medal that I've experienced. And after that Olympics, I became the director of all of our teams. So that's kind of my path on how I got there uh, a little bit. It was just being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people. And also, I think not looking ahead to something else. I had no idea that this thing existed. 
and I sort of fell my way into it, which is which is pretty lucky. Um, I also work uh, on some FIBA things. I'm president of FIBA Americas. So FIBA is the international um, governing body of basketball in the world. Um, and it is split into five zones. The Americas is one of those zones and I'm now the president of that zone uh, and doing a lot of work on commissions, competitions, commissions, and those kinds of things. So that's kind of my story and uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Carol. And uh, we just talked about this and Carol's not gonna say it. So I'm gonna say it for her because she's being humble. Um, in August, you'll officially be inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. So just wanted to share that with you all so you understand the caliber of people that we, we have on this panel and how impressive it really is. And Carol, it is an absolute honor to have you on this panel. Um, very exciting. So thank you. Um, Paul, how are you going to follow that? I don't introduction? know if I can. I'd better just kind of go full disclosure. <laughs> I came in dead last in my March Madness pool at the office. And in a moment of <laughs> poor decision making, which I've had many of in the last year, I let my 12 year old son, who's a basketball nut participate and he won it all. So he called it, he picked Baylor. So there was a Florence in first, but there was a Florence in last too. And unfortunately I'm the one that was in last. So take whatever I say with a grain of salt. Um, I may not have a lot of wisdom when it, or, or street cred when it comes to talking about um, the sports industry, but I'm a self-described Olympic junkie. Um, I got into the movement Fairly soon after college, I talked my way into a job with the Salt Lake Organizing Committee, which was in charge of hosting the 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake. Um, again, there were a lot of these entities, kind of like Carol said, you don't even know they exist until you spend a little time and understanding how all of this works. Uh, talked my way into a job there, fell in love with um, kind of the back of house and behind the scenes part of it. I'd been in love with the Olympics since I was seven years old and um, watched the uh, the downhill ski race and decided that's what I wanted to do. I was never good enough to be a Olympic level racer, but just was in love with, enamored with the whole concept of the Olympics from a very young age. So um, loved my experience in Salt Lake and then just stayed in the movement. And um, I ended up working for organizing committees, sponsors, the International Olympic Committee, um, private clients who would go and then came back to the USOPC in 2019. Um, when they offered me a position and I knew I couldn't say no because this is where my heart was. And I work, I help lead up operations for the foundation, which is the fundraising um, arm of the USOPC. And we'll get into that in a minute. But um, one of the things that we focus on is taking donors to the Olympic Games. Um, and so that's been a huge focus since I got here uh, in 2019 was preparing to do that for Tokyo, uh, a massive program, huge uh, impact. Um, and complexities from a logistical standpoint, which Tim Welt knows because I nag him all the time with questions and requests. Um, I did the same with AJ when he was with us. Um, we, uh, the foundation has a kind of a unique footprint in the organization where we, we interact with every single team and functional area, which I love, and we get a chance to work with everybody. So um, one of the things that I think is most special about it though is, is connecting donors directly to Team USA athletes and having them um, really have that Olympic and Paralympic experience in a way that that is um, truly unforgettable. So um, that's what I love doing. And um, Tokyo has been no shortage of challenges, which we'll, I'm, I know this group will be happy to talk about um, on this call today. Um, but it's it's kind of fun to tackle new things all the time. And that's what we do at the USOPC. That's amazing. I, I love the that story of, of how you became enamored with the Olympics. And it's amazing to see you know, you feel like you spoke it into existence and then you really manifested it. So that's really awesome. And you can tell, you know, just by talking to you for a short time that you really love what you do. So that's very exciting for us to get to chat with you about that. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and then AJ gets to round us out and uh, I will let you take it from there, AJ. Sounds good. Hi everyone, uh, my name is AJ Turkovich. Um, when I was first asked to do this by Cole, I worked in the Olympic movement. I have since moved to a different position. I'll get to that in a second, but I'll start uh, with where, where I was coming from. Um, I worked for the US Olympic and Paralympic Properties when I left, which is actually a different arm of the Olympic Committee. Um, it's uh, the 
marketing arm basically of, of promoting and, and doing all the sponsorship and rights for the US Olympic Committee and all, all their properties in the Los Angeles 2028 games. Um, so whenever you get a games in America, uh, some funky things happen with, with the commercial rights with all the properties. Um, so they form what they call a joint venture. Um, and that's what I worked for there. Um, I was the manager of consumer products uh, and oversaw all of our apparel licensees. So Nike, Ralph Lauren, Oakley, among uh, other smaller ones as well, uh, was my day-to-day -day responsibilities, managing those relationships and in creating licensed goods um, that, that we sold and, and made royalties off of. Um, my games role, uh, while I was there, uh, I oversaw an event called the Team USA Welcome Experience, which is what where all the athletes come through. It's the very first thing they do when they get to the games. Um, Cole has actually worked it for me multiple times. Um, and, and we receive the athletes uh, and it's, you know, they're, they're all around the world uh, training, uh, performing as USA Swimming, USA Basketball, whatever it might be. When they come to us uh, at Team Processing, or sorry, the Team USA Welcome Experience, um, they, they become the, the US Olympic and Paralympic team. They get all their gear, they leave as Team USA. And from that point on, they represent um, the uh, Team USA at the games. And all they have to worry about from that point on is, is competing. So um, it's an awesome experience for them. Uh, we turned it into uh, a really fun, fun time for them, uh, all the athletes. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that was what I did there. And, and previous to that, I worked in the events department and I worked in our hospitality uh, section. Um, and I helped oversee uh, what we call USA House at the Games, uh, which is uh, our business and hospitality center at the Games where we host sponsors and family members and athletes um, at the Games. Since then, I've moved to a new role um, at a company called One Team Partners. They're a newer uh, company within, within this sports uh, landscape. Uh, they've only been for, around for about a year. Uh, and I'm doing basically the same thing that I was at the US uh, Olympic and Paralympic Properties. Uh, so I'm a licensing account manager and we work with uh, a few of the major uh, professional players associations. So we work with the NFL PA, uh, Major League Baseball PA, WNBA PA, uh, the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team PA um, and MLS PA. So I work with them and I work basically do the same thing. I create licensed merchandise uh, on their behalf. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Congrats on your new role. And uh, I know we'll talk in a little bit about uh, the USA, Team USA Welcome Experience, but I imagine that's just a really special moment for um, the athletes representing the U.S. in the Olympics. So I'm excited to chat a little bit more about that. Um, but before we get there, I want to circle back to Tim. Um, I know a lot of us want to close the books on 2020 and COVID, um, but, <laughs> but uh, with events and logistics and Tokyo coming up, that's not quite possible for y'all right now. I know it's impacted the games First, it postponed the games and now, you know, no international guests. So can you just talk to us a little bit on, on how you've handled the impact and what kind of impact COVID has had on what's arguably the world's largest stage in sports? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, as, as Paul sort of mentioned, but that's something I live every day, um, as most of us all do, just in, in different different ways. But on the logistical side, it's certainly something that... Um, yeah, while we'd love to close the book on on COVID and and all that, we're very much in the planning that it's it's here uh, through Tokyo and likely through Beijing as well. So um, uh, for the next couple games at least. So um, yeah, I think starting with the postponement, obviously it's it's that announcement and and trying to figure out what does that actually mean. Is it postponed a couple of months? Then is it postponed a year? Finally figured out it's it's a full year. So we pretty much had to rework everything that we had had done before. So all of our agreements, um, you know, even in the minimum terms of, of just updating the dates, right? So, um, and then that's gotta go through every process across the board too. So, um, and then some of them, it's, it's still uh, in process now. We're still working with Tokyo 2020 on our accommodations. Um, and, and Paul knows this very well. 
um, as to what our allocation is for our accommodations through Tokyo 2020. Um, what we what we can return based on you know the the new update of of no overseas spectators. Um, you know, obviously it's it's a big thing. We years out, we we go ahead and we actually get resources. So we'll get hotel rooms, we'll get vehicles, we'll get um, you know spaces, uh, a space to train. Um, you know, ballrooms as as AJ talked about for for uh, Team USA welcome experience, USA House, um, the NGBs as as Carol knows they get their own resources sometimes as well and and go through all of that planning. So shifting all of that, you know, a year later might seem easy. Let's just change the dates. Um, it's very much not that way. And this is proving out to be that, um, you know, so in addition to that, um, you know, I think uh, looking at this also from the athlete perspective, right, is had to have been incredibly and it still is incredibly difficult for them to, you know, that, that mindset piece. Um, and um, looking at that from an NGB and a USOPC perspective is, um, you know, helping them to, to accomplish the same things they've been working for just in sort of a different, different world from that standpoint. So I know we see a lot of things and we're still trying to provide as much as we possibly can with a lot of uncertainty still, um, you know, and, and that's sort of across the board. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the, one of the big things that was, that came out of this is, is the communication side of things. So I, I think it really highlighted how many organizations are involved in the games. Um, and, and I think to Carol's point of, we don't even know a lot of this exists sometimes, right? Um, but IOC, IPC, um, the organizing committee, all of the national Olympic committees um, and Paralympic committees, um, international federations, national federations, NGBs, um, all the sponsors, various governments, um, and they, there's everything is, is a little bit different to each one of those, right? And so I think that's something we're definitely working through right now is all the protocols. I mean, it, it's even to the details of, of entry into the country um, and those restrictions, right? So that's sort of stop one. Can you even get there? Um, and so our, you know, our team in events and logistics obviously starts with the flights, and ends with the flights on sort of the bookends. Um, and then everything in between that of the transportation, all the shipping and freight, um, <clears throat> you know, the accommodations, all that stuff. So um, we've had to, to make huge adjustments from, from that standpoint. Um, and I think even looking at then what all the COVID protocols will be during the games of which Tokyo 2020 is still determining that and the Japanese government. And, um, and so, you know, putting that all into perspective and, and realizing that um, that's a lot of information to flow through all of those types of organizations, um, you know, that I sort of named off. Um, and, and that's difficult. Um, and so I, I think there was a pretty big realization and it continues to evolve. Um, you know, we continually try to figure out how do we communicate better? How do we get information that we, we're not getting right now? um and and sort of work through it that way so um communication is a big piece to that um as i said the new protocols we're still figuring out you know sort of high level how do you get into the country 14 days quarantine maybe 14 days prior do you charter flights do you um, go commercial how does that work do you have to do 14 days upon arrival in country um you know any of the testing stuff um, so that's all very new to, uh, to many of us and to many countries from that standpoint. Right. So, um, and then I think one of the other things that's, that's probably not all that well known, but, and I guess, fortunately for, for me, I don't have to do a ton of this, but is, is honestly, it's a, it's a big deal in the, the Olympic and Paralympic world is the qualification, right. And the test events. So that's been all knocked off kilter and, and, um, you know, isn't the same as it, as it was. Um, I mean, we now have seen several other test events, which were qualifying events for, uh, for sports pushed back even further. Um, there's a, now there's a new one. I think baseball now is pushed back to, to June. So, um, so that sort of continues and that all actually does trickle down to us of, we won't know who's named to the teams to where we can actually book a flight for them. We can make sure we've got housing directly in their name 
um, you know, plan all that out. So um, that, that trickle down happens and it just happens very slowly. And, and will, I think we're just sort of taking the lessons of we've got to be flexible um, and we've got to sort of um, as much as you can plan ahead, some of this is going to happen and we're going to have to rearrange on the ground. So um, yeah, I think those are sort of the, the major things um, from our standpoint, but it is, it's every day, it's something new and a new piece of information, which might change something over here that sort of dominoes elsewhere. So you have very little responsibility, clearly. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a lot, right? Like to, you, well, just from hearing you speak, it's, you touch so many different areas and embeds in logistics all the way from, I never considered the trials piece to having those folks names that are on the team to be able to just book a flight and book accommodations. Um, so that, that, you know, that's a really interesting point of view and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, and I mean, agility and flexibility has been the name of the game this past year, right? And um, to do it uh, internationally and at such a large caliber of an event has to be really challenging. So I appreciate you sharing some of those challenges with the group. I think it's really great insight that um, everyone should start to think about when um, thinking about how COVID impacts things like the games, because um, it's that's amazing. Um, so you guys are still, I'm assuming in the events and logistics piece, from if I'm understanding correctly, still in the planning phase and still trying to figure out some of those details and. Um, that's got to be that's got to be pretty stressful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and and I it is still the it's like the replanning phase, and and I think we're going to repeat the replanning phase multiple times. Sure. Um, but very much so. And and there are some things that you can now now we can say for certain, and we know we can do this. But there's still a lot that's that's to be determined, and um, and some of it just sort of keeps evolving as more announcements are made of you know, again, the overseas spectators, that changes our accommodation. So what was our April 5th deadline yesterday is no longer our April 5th deadline because we can't meet it um, <laughs> with the information. So yeah, it definitely is evolving. And, and I'll be really clear, I am very much not the only one. We have, a, we have a massive team effort, honestly, across our organization, across all NGBs. I mean, we rely on, on folks like Carol um, at basketball, um, they are really the ones that are doing a lot of that work to organize their teams and make sure that happens. And, and we're, we're trying to, to fill in and, and get things organized sort of as a, as an overall process. So big, big team effort. Yeah, gosh, I'm sure. And it probably has to be right. You know, with, with all of those moving parts, um, and, you know, while we could probably spend this entire panel talking about COVID and how it impacted the games, um, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your point of view, because I wanted to make sure we, we touched on that from the events and logistics perspective. But to shift gears a little bit, um, I know that there's a lot of students on this call um, that might be interested of like, how do I get started or how do I how do I even get my foot in the door? And we heard a little bit about everyone's path, but but Carol, I want to pick your brain a little bit. Um, I know we talked a little bit about you being in a, a basketball family, high school AD, and then serving on a few committees. Is that a traditional path to where you are today for an NGB? Or what's or is there a traditional path on how you get there? Is it very varied on how, how folks get to the job that you're in? Yeah, I, I think... It's, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest my path was a traditional path. Um, it, you know, even I wouldn't have landed in that end. Uh, I, I had no idea where I was going. But that's also sort of the way I've lived my life. Um, I think the best way to find out about a new location is to get lost and have to figure out how to get back. Um, so I, I'm very much, my philosophy of education is experiential. Uh, I'm very respectful of book learning and of, of experts and teachers, but I think um, the best way to learn is to, to learn through experience. Having said that, though, I, if I look back at all of the people that have pretty much gotten hired at, say, USA Basketball, I'd say the majority have come through it as volunteers you know, support staff volunteers. Uh, we, with the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, 
having a sports management program. Uh, we were, we've been able to tap into a few of those students to come and, and work our camps, our training camps, our trials, because we always need extra people. Uh, with COVID, we've really cut back because we don't want to add more to increase the risk of, of an athlete getting it. But I think that's a major point. I, I think we haven't necessarily utilized the USOPC internship program, but I think that's another great way to get noticed. Um, and then I think, I, I say this to, to everybody, whatever your job is, do the best job you can do full on in that job. Don't always act like you're looking for the next best thing because you're going to work like that. You're going to, you're going to, it's going to be obvious that you're not devoted to what you're doing. Now, I, it's been easy in my life. Uh, you know, I was a head coach of a high school team, so I was devoted to that team. That was important. And then, you know, I'd been a teacher there. I, I uh, you know, I, I was I was able to get the AD job and become an assistant principal as well. And then you just keep your, you know, try anything. Like, I didn't know what this basketball committee was going to be. I thought it was going to be like a high school rules committee. And it, that's about the most boring thing you could possibly think of. And had I said, nah, I don't think so, I, I, I missed out on my career. So I, I just think you wanna you know, do a good job with what you're doing, um, build relationships. I, I think the key to success, and somebody said it, Michelle, I think it was you or Tim, communication is so important, but communication, it's how you communicate with people. I'll give Tim a pat on the back you know, he, he's in a position like when, when we bring a team to the Olympics, um, every little thing can become a huge issue. So our intent is to have a smooth, calm uh, background to everything. You know, athletes are great. I, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy our athletes and, and they're mature. Um, they're not a problem, but you don't want to have, you don't want to have a little thing become a big mountain, you know, a mountain out of a molehill. And one of the things that Tim does is he has a very service oriented approach. You know, I've known him because I knew him when he was, you know, at the, at the training center, uh, you get to know people and the way you treat people on the way up is what, you know, you remember as well. And now all of a sudden, He's kind of a lifeline to something I need when I get to the Olympic Games. And, and I don't know if I've ever come across as being nervous or in a hurry or whatever, but we are. And somebody like Tim isn't going to take offense. He's simply going to try and fix whatever needs to be fixed or do whatever he can for you. And I would say that about everybody that's on this panel. But, you know, I think the way you develop relationships with people and you don't have to always ask for something. Sometimes maybe you give them something, uh, even if it's just a nice smile or, hey, thanks. You know, those kinds of things go a long way in our job. So communication, building relationships. And then I could not do this job if I didn't have an absurd attention to detail. Like right now, we're, you know, we have training camps but before we get there, something we've never had to do before is get everybody tested three times within the week before with a saliva test. They have to do a daily questionnaire 10 days before. And so to put that all into spreadsheets to get to those companies, to make sure that everybody does it, the detail is incredible. And if you are, you know, if you're just in this because you think it'd be cool, you aren't going to be successful. Uh, not only do you have to be a junkie like, Paul, you've got to, you've got to be so into it, you know, during Olympics, if I get four hours of sleep a night, that's a lot just because there is just so much going on and you got to make sure it works. So the glamor, yeah, it's great. I've been to six Olympics, I, but you know, what's the most important thing is the, the, the dinners we've had after, after hours, or it's the, the laughs we had when something funny happens. And, you know, it's all of that that I remember almost more. I mean, there's a certain sense of pride, but um, again, it's, 
it's everybody wants to have the job, but not everybody wants to do the job. And so I, I think those are the, the keys. That's uh, some amazing insights there. And, you know, I kind of, I feel like, you know, when you talk about some of those dinners afterwards or um, trying to do quick, find quick solutions for issues, it's that's when relationships are really built and solidified is when you're in the trenches, you know, side by side with people. Yeah, I, I remember Kelly, what was Kelly's name? The redhead? Mm -hmm. Kelly was in charge of, yeah, she was in charge of, um, of facilities and, and our men and women practice, we were practicing at a facility, geez, where was it? Uh, Beijing maybe, or somewhere. And it, it wasn't doable for NBA, WNBA types of players. The floor wasn't very good. You know, they, there was a scheduling snafu. And, you know, at that point, nerves are frayed and it's not going to go well. And she was terrific in terms of just kind of hanging there and, and taking it. And, and, and then we also realized, you know, she didn't do that on purpose. And she, she was sort of out front of the people that did do it. So you sometimes have to take, take that and, and do it with a, not a smile. You don't want to be cavalier, but you, you have to earnestly try to help. And I, I think that's where you just said it. When those kinds of tragedies hit, you do work together. Sounds like, you know, between Tim and Carol, and I'm sure Paul and AJ will touch on this, but some common thematics I'm already picking up on is just you solutions oriented mindset is so important. Um, and we've talked about this in some of our other panels. Um, you know, Carol, you said something that uh, made me think of our networking panel, if y'all were on it, where we talked about making deposits in relationships before you make withdrawals or making enough deposits. So the withdrawals maybe don't seem so large when you really need them right away and it's a big one. Um, so if you guys aren't seeing those yet, um, just make sure you, you keep paying attention to what these folks are chatting through with us. So um, Carol, incredible insights again. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I wanna shift gears to Paul. And, you know, Paul, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but Team USA is the only Olympic team in the world that doesn't receive government support. Is that right? It's certainly the biggest. I don't know if it's the only. Okay, so a massive presence in the Olympic Games that doesn't receive government support. So where you sit, you know, with donor relations is integral to the function of the Games. So we just had a panel la a couple weeks ago that talked about um, college athletic fundraising. So, you know, they talked about their donors and how they engage their donors, who their donors are. You know, maybe it's former athletes, somebody has a strong connection to the university. So can you talk to us a little bit about one, how you engage donors and, and maybe who your donors are and identify donors? Because, you know, there's not necessarily a ton of alumni coming out of the program, like a college fundraising program. Um, and Two, just how, what are your, some of your strategies with that? Um, but I would love if you could give us some insight. Yeah, great question. And just real quick, while Carol and Tim were talking, I, I, I thought of something that um, I'd heard about the Olympic Games a long time ago, that the Olympics are the most complex logis peacetime logistical exercise on the planet. And if you're planning anything bigger or more complex, you're probably planning some sort of invasion or military exercise. And it's true, it's, it's incredibly complicated. It's also one of the things I love about the Olympics is that it's so much more than just a sporting event. It's, you know, it's kind of like the Super Bowl plus the UN General Assembly plus the World Economic Forum um, all together over 17 days. It's, it's not just, if you think of it as just sports, you're missing a whole component of it, of all these nodes of power, of political power, of cultural power, of economic power coming together um, in one place for 17 days. And there's nothing like it in the world. Um, that's one of the things I love. Um, from a donor standpoint, you know, we're, it's important to remember, we're one of 206 National Olympic Committees. So we're in a constellation of all these others. We're certainly the biggest, Team USA, but um, there are so many others out there. And any country you can name has a National Olympic Committee. M nearly all of them, like you said, Michelle, are funded by the government. So if you think about other countries, oftentimes at a cabinet level, they have a minister of sport who runs 
their um, sporting programs and their oftentimes their National Olympic Committee. And there's dedicated government funding that goes right into the National Olympic Committee. We don't have that. It's just the, the quirk of the system. That's how it was set up. And so we receive all our, um, we receive our support from sponsors, but also from donors. And um, donors are the one guaranteed source of revenue that we have um, for the, um, for Team USA. And so we rely on them for everything we're doing. You know, we are the best, um, I, I think, and I think my art panelists would agree, we're the best um, team in the world at the, particularly at the summer games, we're always at the top of the medal count. And that's because um, it's in no small part due to the support that we get from donors, sponsors. Obviously, it's the athletes that do the that that deliver those results, but they couldn't do it without um, supportive donors. So we um, affinity is not necessarily something that you know, like a university that you have natural affinity to your school. Um, so we go out and cultivate donors in a variety of ways. A lot of times through um, just kind of re ref referrals. We also have many levels of of giving from our annual fund, which is um, anything up to $2,500 a year and then levels of giving on above that. And what the, the main source of success that we found is connecting our donors to um, Team USA athletes and having them tap into what that experience is like and having them understand what it means to support Team USA on and off the field. And if we're effective at doing that, then we raise more funds. Um, and the most effective, I guess the most complex and effective vehicle at the same time um, for donors is taking them to the Olympics and having them experience firsthand. And there's nothing quite like seeing, you know, kind of like, we all have this, a, a mem an Olympic memory we can point to in our lives. Every single person on my screen, I could ask you, hey, what's your first memory of the Olympics? And we'd all have it. Our donors do too. It doesn't matter how much money they have and all the other cool things they've done in their lives. There's a moment where they turn into children and you can see it in their eyes where they feel that Olympic magic. And so we're in the business, we're always trying to create that for them. Um, and it's the easiest to do at the games and connecting them directly to the athletes having that experience because once they have it, they want more of it. They wanna help, they wanna support. And so that's why our games programs are such a big part of um, uh, the foundation and what we do from a fundraising perspective. We're obviously now pivoting because as of two weeks ago, we are not taking 1200 donors to Tokyo as we've been planning to do um, for the past five years. So we're gonna get creative this summer in terms of how we can still connect um, our donors directly to our athletes. We're gonna have to be innovative in terms of technology and some of the other platforms we do, but that's, you know, that's, it's a challenge we're happy to accept and um, something that we're gonna tackle as we head into Tokyo, but also probably Beijing as well. Well, how do you keep donors engaged in the off years of the games since it's so event focused? Uh, great question. We, we, a lot of times we'll bring athletes to them. So um, we'll have a donor will host an event at their house, say in Seattle, and we'll bring a, we'll bring a, um, either a future or legend athlete to their home to talk about their experience. And they'll bring their medals, they'll bring their, you know, things like that. And you can just see on the faces as these donors turn in, like I said, they turn into children and they, they want to wear the medal and they want a picture with the athlete. And we do a lot of those kind of things. Um, we do, during COVID, we were, you know, that took away our ability to gather and um, in, in person. So we had to get creative about doing it virtually. We did virtual workouts. We did webinars with, um, with athletes and coaches and um our um, sports medicine experts and all these different people to kind of pull back the curtain for our donors to see all that goes into preparing for a games. And so um, it's actually given us an opportunity to do it, to, to make that connection in different ways, but we're always trying to reconnect um, or keep that, that connection going even in off years or um, out of cycle. And so we're also moving forward, gonna to try to take um, donors to other events, you know, World, Women's World Cup, um, Women, uh, World Athletic Track and Field Championships are in Eugene, Oregon next summer, that kind of thing. So we're always looking for more experiences like that to make that connection. I love that. I can imagine um, I would probably act like a child to revert to, <laughs> to a child if I had an experience like that. And that's, that's amazing. I love that. Um, Cause the, you know, when they, I feel, it sounds like you, 
you guys really put your arm around your donors and, and bring them into part of the Olympic family. Um, and they feel that on a very real level. So I can imagine how effective that is and probably a great retention tactic too. Um, keeps them coming back to get experiences that you like money can't buy, right? It's just part of the family. Absolutely. So that's, uh, that's amazing. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and then AJ, I want to, uh, I want to go over to you and talk about your time when you worked on um, Team USA House. We were talking a little bit about hospitality, right, with Paul. Um, and Team USA House is like the hot spot for donor hospitality, right, at the games. So um, can you share with us how and why that experience is so impactful? I think Paul into it a little bit, but um, I definitely want to hear your perspective as well after being so close to it. Yeah. Um, so what we do just to kind of first explain what, what it is to everybody. So uh, USA House is, is our business and hospitality center at the games. Um, and it services a lot of people. We, we'll end up um, taking over a facility usually. Sometimes we build our own um, structure, which we did uh, two times, once in Rio and once in uh, Russia. No, not in Rio, uh, once in um, Pyeongchang and once in Russia. Um, but yeah, we, we, we build out a space um, that we can host all of our Team USA VIP guests. And by VIP guests, that's a pretty wide range. We have uh, the most important being the athletes uh, is a place that they can come after they're done competing uh, and, and have fun with their family and friends. Um, we have donors, Paul's group. Uh, that, that we host. Uh, it's a very important piece of what they sell in to their, their donors. Um, and the same with sponsors. Uh, sponsors are paying big bucks to be a Team USA sponsor. Um, and this is a part of the rights that they buy into is, is having access to USA House. It's not open to the general public. It's not something you can just walk up to um, and show that, um, hey, I wanna come in, I'm a US citizen. Um, Fortunately, it doesn't work that way uh, because there's pretty limited capacities. So, um, and then, you know, a, there's there's a, a range of other uh, VIP guests that will host there, government officials, um, stuff like that. But overall, um, it's kind of like a little home away from home for those VIPs. Uh, when you go into one of these uh, foreign countries, it, it, it can be... Um, can be a little overwhelming, you know, and, and if you're in, if you're in uh, Russia, for, for example, uh, and, you know, maybe you don't love Russian food the whole time. Well, when you come to USA House, you could probably get a hamburger or a hot dog, uh, which is cool. Um, and you can uh, cheer on Team USA. And, and the other thing is you get, you might like you, putting the, the, the size of the games in perspective uh, again, you can probably go to one, maybe two events in a day, but everything is so spread out and so difficult to get around. Um, it, it's kind of hard to do more than one event a day. So what are you doing to fill that other time? A lot of those VIP guests will come to USA House. Um, it's uh, typically unlimited food, um, unlimited drinks. Um, and then you can go there and you can watch. We always have live feed of everything going on. Um, so if there's Team USA uh, competing in any event, it's going to be on a screen. There's usually like 30, 40, 50 plus screens there. Um, and you can watch, just sit there and watch watch the games um, uh, with, with other Team USA fans and, and uh, enjoy some hospitality put on by the U.S. Olympic and, uh, Olympic and Paralympic uh, Committee. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, it's a big part of, of what we sell in to those groups. Um, and then the, the, the awesome part is it, it kind of gives uh, those, those VIPs access to something they could never get um, elsewise. Um, one, because of the access, but two, because once athletes are done competing, they come there. Uh, so you could be just there as a, a sponsor guest or a donor um, and uh, Michael Phelps could be there, sitting there with his family. Um, and, and then we usually typically do, or if, if the women's basketball team just won their gold medals, 
we can host them in. We do what we call managing victory tour, and they come in and they receive, um, you know, uh, recognition from the house. So it's just something that you can't get uh, elsewhere, um, which is is something that's super valuable to those those parties that are invited. Sounds like it's just a, you know a little bit more of that extension of really putting your arms around your donors, your sponsors, and it, it truly is a an Olympic family, like that's the word that keeps coming to mind is because y'all are, are doing this massive thing together, you know, and you're doing it with, you know, your internal folks, external folks, extensions of the, the games, and then your sponsors, your donors, and um, that experience sounds amazing. And it sounds like it's really like once in a lifetime or something that the most, most amazing thing about that is that's something that a lot of people will never get to do. And so the fact that you get to provide that experience for folks is, you know, outstanding. Um, and I'm sure they uh, they geek out a little bit, you know, when the athletes come in because, uh, you know, they're clearly sports fans. So I love it. And I, I think that's a very unique experience um, and just really important to the, the whole experience at the games. You know, you're not just sending people, putting them up in a hotel and giving them some recommendations. It's really first class, top notch stewardship. Um, and I think something that, you know, if anyone on this call is going into donor relations, fundraising, sponsorship, um, should really take note of. I know um, I will for sure, you know, in my role. So I appreciate you really going into that, AJ, and thank you. Um, so with our last eight minutes, I wanna do a quick round robin with everybody. Um, I know we talked a little bit about Carol, you shared a lot of the skill sets that you need to be in your role and some of the things that are important for a role like yours. I want to do a quick round robin on if you had to choose the top three skill sets for somebody in your role, what would they be? Um, and Tim, if you don't mind, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, and actually, Carol hit on a lot of these, so they may be repeats, but um, <laughs> detail oriented. So obviously, in, in the logistics side, you have details matter, um, you know, uh, and it, and it can be a, a pretty big deal, um, from that standpoint, critical thinker. So, and I think Michelle, you mentioned sort of solution oriented, um, or, or maybe Carol mentioned that as well. So I think that's a huge thing. We problem solve all day long. Um, and, and certainly on the ground, that is, uh, at least half of our role. Um, and then, uh, communication skills and sort of ability to interact. So, so much that we do, and, and I think Carol hit on this as well as the relationship piece. That's why we're starting, um, you know, we're starting six years out, you know, the games are named seven years out ordinarily. Um, we're starting with the organizing committees and folks on the ground six years out from the games um, and continuing to build those relationships. Um, and then you never know what role you're going to play um, and you have to be comfortable talking to people and asking for things that you maybe wouldn't normally or trying to get information that will help you. So, um, so communication and the ability to inter interact at, at all levels, all cultures, um, language, um, working through that all adds another dynamic to it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, AJ, go ahead. Yeah, I'd say uh, 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 definitely detail oriented. Uh, I'm not going to re repeat that. I think every single one of us will probably say that one bit. Customer service, uh, just a, a huge thing. Uh, just having that that customer service mentality. Um, I did my uh, college internship at Disney's Wide World of Sports, so went through the whole Disney training uh, on customer service and. And I think that's important on, on every level because when you're when you're working um, in the Olympics, you can have so many different types of customers. Obviously, the most important being the athletes. Um, but then you 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 know, in my role, we're working with Paul's group. Uh, we're working with sponsors. We're working with licensees, um, and and so many other people. You know, volunteers. Um, everybody's a a different type of customer, and and having that mentality and and always trying to exceed expectations as opposed to just meeting expectations um, is something that I think everybody um, at Team USA uh, strives for on a daily basis. So huge one there. Um, the other one I would say is probably um, creativity. 
um, you're seeing that with uh, Tokyo, how are you being creative in, in navigating issues? How can we be creative um, in thinking outside the box on a daily basis um, in, in the way we go about uh, training, um, the way we go about logistics, the way we go about working with our licensees and creating these experiences. Um, so I think creativity is another huge one that um, you can utilize across all aspects. Love that. Thank you. Carol, I know you touched on a couple, but anything to add to the your sentiments before? Yeah, I, I do actually. I uh, Tart Vanderveer, who's a coach at Stanford, just won the national championship, was the, was our Olympic coach in 96. So I spent a year with her and she used to give out little sayings every day. And the one I, I've remembered forever is the definition of maturity. And maturity has nothing to do with age. It's when you think more of others than yourself and how liberating that is when you realize that most of the people you work with or deal with are really thinking more about themselves. It's, it's liberating to, to me to do what I need to do. So, you know, it's, it's when you think more of others than yourself. So, for instance, you have to prioritize when you're in the heat of the battle, what's the most important thing? And so when I said that I get four hours of sleep at night, that's because I know that my relationship with the coaches is incredibly important. So if the coaches want to meet or the coaches want to go out to dinner, I go do that with them because I spend time with them and you build that relationship, you build that investment. So you have to prioritize in your mind what things have to get done when, and you don't necessarily not do something, but you might have to do it at midnight. Um, second thing, athletes the same way, you know, I, we have 12 athletes at the Olympics and they all have my cell phone. And when they all want something, they will send a text and you have to be ready to again, deal with them uh, because we always, you know, we, we need to keep them moving forward towards the gold medal. We don't need to have things blow up. Final thing I would say is to do the little things. I don't mind doing laundry. I don't mind sweeping the floor. I don't mind doing those things. Sometimes it's, it's exhilarating to just get away and go do that. Um, sometimes it's not my job and others should do it, but I think you have to be willing to do the little things and not then complain about it. Just go do it. You know, it's okay. That was those, that's what I would add. I love that. That reminds me of one of my, my favorite quotes and it's just never get too big to sweep the sheds. And it's, that's exactly, uh, that reminds me exactly of that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, all right, Paul, you get to round us out here. What do, what do you think about top skills for a job like yours? Yeah, thank you. I think there, there's some common themes emerging here. I think one, you have to be passionate about what you do because these are, these are intense jobs, long hours. Um, you don't go into it for the money, but if you're passionate about a certain sport or, or industry, follow it because it'll make all the difference on those, on those long days. Um, you gotta be cool under pressure. These are intense jobs too. And if you lose your cool, if you yell at somebody, if you break down in tears, that doesn't help your team. You gotta, you gotta be the steady hand at the wheel, no matter how intense the pressure is. And that makes a huge difference um, in, a, in a games environment or just with any team you're working with. And then I think, and several of uh, my panelists, or my fellow panelists talked about being a utility player. It's just so important. Everybody wants to be there and you know help Queen Elizabeth into the executive suite at the London Olympics, but sometimes you gotta do that. And then you gotta go unclog a toilet on the same day. And um, all of that can be part of your job description and you've got to be okay with it because we're troubleshooters at the end of the day and it's whatever gets the job done. And, um, and I think that's, that's just a, such an important thing to remember is you, like you said, you never get too big to sweep and do some of these other jobs. I think if you do those three, those three things well, you'll be successful in whatever aspect of this industry you end up going into. I love that. Um... Thank you for sharing that. And thank you guys. I know it's eight o'clock. I want to be it's eight o'clock my time, central time. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so Tim, AJ, Carol, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time. While a lot of you are prepping for Tokyo, um, I know time is probably very hard to come by. So I certainly extend my appreciation, the university's appreciation for you spending the 60 minutes with us. Um, I learned so much. I'm confident everybody else did. 
Um, so thank you so much. Thank you guys for attending and paying attention and coming. I look forward to seeing some of your remarks after this. And the most importantly, tune in and watch the games this summer. TV ratings are very important. So make sure you turn it on and you, you watch and you root for Team USA and think about these guys when you do that. Um, so as always, connect with everybody on LinkedIn, stay in touch. Um, and thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. And everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.